Thank you, praise team. Do you know that wonderful Savior? Oh, what a Savior. Uh, it's just uh, an awesome thought to think when this chilly waters comes, uh, I'm going to have a Savior to be there with me. You know the reason I'm going to be able, you're going to be able to be in that wonderful course, that choir, that heavenly choir, is because of, oh, what a wonderful Savior. Uh, nothing that we were able to do. So uh, I praise God for a wonderful, wonderful Savior. And uh, it's just amazing how the Holy Spirit works because one of those verses, and I get them all mixed up, but one of those verses talked about Jesus leaving the riches uh, of heaven and coming down here. Uh, and in the scripture that we're going to be reading today and talking to you about today, it talks about uh, God's riches. And uh, church, I want you to look at this in a positive, positive way. I know you feel like I preach to you to change and do all this. I just want you to realize that there's some things available to you uh, that we need to uh, really reach out for. Uh, in Ephesians is where I'm going to be, chapter 3, and I'm going to read verses uh, 14 uh, through 16. I was going to get into 17, but I think I'll leave that for next week. Uh, and I, I actually preached on part of this verse, or maybe all of it, the other day, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but God has just kind of took me back and said, there's, there's some deepness here that we need to look at. And uh, I want you to realize today, uh, I'm making some assumptions. I can't take you to Ephesians chapter 3 and say that God said to Paul, but I believe that Ephesians chapter 3 is inspired of God. It was God speaking to Paul. It wasn't Paul writing something that Paul thought the church at Ephesus. God spoke to Paul and said, write this down. So if God spoke these words to Paul, I'm making an assumption that if he asked Paul to pray this for the church at Ephesus, that God knew that he could grant what he had asked Paul to pray for. Does that make any sense? So if God asked Paul to pray something that he knew he could and would grant, then I would say if we prayed the same thing because God said that, then we could also look for it to be granted to us. Uh, and again, we spend so much time and energy, and in church we have just been overwhelmed with sickness and death and different things. Uh, and I appreciate the church. And Travis uh, Poteet uh, sent me a text yesterday, and he said, tell the church thank you for your prayers with the situation with his mom in uh, Fort Smith. Uh, and I know that I can call you and say, so-and-so's in the hospital or so-and-so, something has just happened, and we need to pray. But I want to ask you, if I challenge you today to pray for each other spiritually, how good are we at it? Do we ever pray for the inner man? Do you ever pray for the inner man of your pastor? I believe if I had a heart attack and was on my way to heart hospital right now, you'd be on your knees praying for me. I believe that. And I believe that you have a access to God and you have availability to discuss those things with him. But I want to ask you, when's the last time you prayed for my inner being? When's the last time you prayed for me spiritually to be strengthened? When's the last time I prayed for you? Well, I've studied this scripture, so I've done it a little more this week than normal because it, it, this really spoke to me this week. But I want us to think about, and we'll read the scripture here and get into the scripture. I want us to think about this morning, for example. We got up, we took a shower, we got our men probably shaved, uh, women got their perfume, their makeup, their lipstick. We did all of this outward appearance because we wanted to look nice when we got to Copper Springs Baptist Church. What did you do spiritually during that same time frame to be ready to worship God today? See, I don't believe the Bible teaches that I can just come in here and fall in a seat and say, here I am, God. I'm here to worship you. My heart's coming to you, so just receive my praise. It don't work that way. We have to be ready to worship God. We have to do a little cleaning house. We have to kind of put our thoughts and our minds and everything under his authority and say, I'm here to worship you. So I want us to compare the outward to the inner, and I want you to realize that Paul wasn't praying for physical health. Paul wasn't praying for financial gain. 
Paul was praying for the church at Ephesus for inner strength of God's holy power through his Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 3, if you will, stand in reverence to the reading of God's word. We're going to read verses 14 uh, through 16. I'm reading out the uh, New King James. It says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. Let's pray. Heavenly Fathers, we bow in your presence today. I praise you for what a wonderful, loving Savior that Jesus Christ is, was, will be in the future. I praise you for what he is. I pray this morning that our minds, our hearts would be focused upon the resurrected Jesus Christ that is the Lord and Savior of our lives as born-again believers. And if there's someone here today that's never experienced a resurrected Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, the forgiveness of their sins, setting the wrath of God aside in their life because of what Jesus did on the cross, I pray today, Holy Spirit, that you will convict that person, that you will lead them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior today. I pray for those that have already experienced that. I pray for open hearts. I pray for open ears. I pray for minds to be settled in on the Word of God. I pray that this might be challenging to each of your children here today. I pray if there's sins that need to be confessed, I pray that they will be before this service is, has ended. I pray if there's changes that needs to be made in the lives of individuals next week, that this message will not be left here after the service ends, but it will be taken, that it will be put into everyday walk of life in each individual's life that the Holy Spirit deals with here in this service today. And if there's someone here today that feels like that they've got it all together and that they really don't need to make any changes, I pray that you humble that person, that you get them to look at you as to who you really are. And I just pray that inner strength might be granted to each and every one that is here today. I pray that you anoint me. I pray that I would say nothing that would not be anointed of your Holy Spirit. I pray that if there's a thought of mine that I have, that you would bind that thought. I pray that it would not be said today. I pray that everything that's said would be said in love. I pray that it would be your word that would go forth and that your word would change lives for your kingdom. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to give a very quick uh, review, and I usually don't do uh, reviews, but I'm, I'm going to do a real quick review on what we were talking about. Uh, in verse 14, he said, for this reason. Now, there's a lot of people, commentary-wise, that says he's only referring back to that he's going through some tribulation that you'll find in uh, verse 13. He said, I don't want you to lose heart at my tribulations uh, for you, which is your glory, and that that's what that phrase, for your reason. I personally don't agree with that. I personally think... Uh, that when Paul started this prayer and when Paul said, for this reason, I think it goes much deeper than the tribulations that he was going through. I think Paul was excited. He was elated. He was just overwhelmed that God had actually invited the Gentiles in. There had not been a promise of that through the Old Testament. And Paul had found out that the Gentiles, and Paul was called to preach to the Gentiles, and, and I think Paul was just overwhelmed with humbleness that God has invited us as Gentiles to become a part of the family of God. And he said, for this cause, I want you to notice what he did here. He said, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I, I shared a couple of weeks ago when my dad was at Conway Regional and the, the doctors and the nurses kept coming in and out. I knew there was something that wasn't right. Uh, and Daddy flatlined, and most of you that have uh, been around the hospital, his heart quit. I mean, everything, the monitors just went flat. And when they did, they dropped the, I think it was the head of his bed uh, down and nurses come running in. They hollered cold blue. And I mean, they were coming off of every elevator. Uh, I fell on my knees outside that room because I was scared. Thought my daddy was gone. Daddy's still there today. But you know what this verse of scripture says to me? When is the last time 
that I fell on my knees in humbleness before God because I have been accepted by the blood of Jesus Christ and adopted as one of his children. How much greater is that that God has adopted me through his son Jesus Christ? How much greater is that than my dad in his physical health because my dad knows Jesus as his personal savior. If, he had, if that line had never started beating and he had a flat line and died right there in that hospital, he was going on to be with God in heaven because of what Jesus Christ had done down here. So how much greater is it for me to bow on my knees and say, thank you God that you adopted me as part of your family through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what I believe Paul was doing is Paul was so humbled because of what God had done through his son Jesus Christ in inviting the Gentiles in to be a part of the family of God that he actually fell on his knees in reverence to God. When's the last time you fell on your knees in reverence to God for what God has done through his son Jesus Christ and just said, thank you that I've been adopted as part of your family through your son Jesus Christ. Now Paul goes on and he talked about the family here, but I want to get to verse 16 very quickly. I want us to look right here. I want you to notice this is Paul. Remember where Paul's at right now, according to the scripture. Paul's down on his knees. Is that not right? Paul is praying right now. What did Paul pray? Paul prayed that he, who's he? Now, in my Bible, in the New King James, it's got a capital H on the he. So that tells me that he, and he is talking. Who is he talking to? He said, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to just put that in there. Paul said that God, I'm taking the he out right here, and I'm putting in that God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, would grant you. Now I want to, I want to tell you something that I, I really think we need to understand. I think sometimes we get so hung up on ourselves and what we can do and all of the things that we can accomplish and we forget to realize what Paul has just said. Now I want us to look at those terms for just a minute. Paul said, I'm talking to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and I am asking him to grant you now, did he say, go to church for six Sundays straight and I'll give it to you? Did he say, go to your pastor and have counseling and prayer and all of that and I'll give it to you? I want us to look at the terms. And I looked at them in the Greek. I looked at them in the English dictionary. And they basically mean the same thing. What he said, a very simple definition when he said that God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, would grant you, it means he'd give it to you. See, we, we get hung up on that, don't we? God's not going to give us anything that we don't earn, right? Ephesians says that it's by grace. It's not anything that you were able to do, able to earn. And I'm almost scared to say this to a Baptist congregation. But you can't do anything that will make you love God more than God seeing Jesus Christ in your life. Now you say, okay, I won't be back to church anymore. Then you better question your salvation if you've got an attitude of that this morning. I'm telling you, if Jesus is living in your heart and in your life, there's going to be a desire and there's going to be some actions that's going to back up the faith and the power of the Holy Spirit that lives and reigns and you're going to want to fellowship with other Christian people. But he said, I want, to, I, I want the God of our Father to grant you and I found a, a, a definition. It says to transfer. Now keep this in mind. Keep this in mind. What's he asking for him to transfer? What is he saying? He said, I want the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant you, or I'm going to put in there, I want him to transfer to you. Now this is Paul praying on his knees for the church at Ephesus. What's he about to ask for? 
Let's go on for just a minute. He said, I want him to grant you, and then he said, according to, and it's just getting better and better right here. I want him to grant you according to, the word according to, is a, it, it means as directed in a way that is based on something. So he's saying according to, it's based on something. Is it based on something that the church at Ephesus can do? Is it based on a, a one year a perfect attendance to all the church services? Is it based on a daily devotion that is never broken? It is a grant. I'm giving it to you. I'm transferring it to you. I'm transferring, and what is he saying? I'm transferring it according to Something else. What's that something else that's coming up? I've been in the Baptist face for years. I think sometimes that our mind gets so wrapped up in ourselves that we can't let God be God. We have been taught, and don't get me wrong, I understand the Bible talks about if you sin, there's going to be discipline. I'm not saying that God does not discipline his children. The Bible teaches us that he does. But I'm saying today, and uh, Brother Larry's here with us today, Brother Larry White, and uh, we, we went through a revitalization conference just a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about prayer. I think people, we need to get down on our knees and get a hold of God and let God be God because Southern Baptist, Gary Burden, Copper Springs, nobody else has the program to change lives uh, that God has. And they never will have. We're advancing in technology. Praise God for it. But I can tell you there'll never be a technology that will take the place of the power of God in His Holy Spirit. Now let's look at what he said. He said, I've got something here that I want to grant to you. I want to transfer it to you. He's praying that God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ would grant you or that he would transfer it to you according to the riches of his glory. Do you understand what he just said? Riches can be the wealth. If you want to put wealth in or you want to leave riches in, either way is fine. But I want you to get your mind wrapped around this morning where the wealth is coming from and where the riches is coming from. It's not coming from the Southern Baptist denomination and it's not coming from Gary Burden as pastor and it's not coming from the heritage that you had all the way back down to the great grandpas and the great great grandpas and all of that kind of stuff it's coming uh, from God the father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ now let me ask you a question I want you to think on this for just a minute what's the wealth of God I can't wrap my mind around it. When I say I can't love you, is there enough wealth of love in heaven that God can give me love to love you even though I don't want to? When I say I just can't forgive that person I have over and over and over again and I'm not doing it again, is there enough wealth in heaven for me to have forgiveness for that person? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Church, I'm asking us to tap in. Let's tap into the wealth of God. It's not within our power. You can't do it on your own. You can't find a program that will lead you to that. You can go through the prayer journals and there's nothing wrong with those. And you can go through the Beth Moore classes and you can go through the Bible studies and you can go through everything. But until God grants it to you, it will. You know what? There's no limit to the resources. Do you realize what Paul is praying for the church at Ephesus? What if you got up every morning next week and you said all of those people that were there at Copper Spring, God, I pray that you grant them, uh, that you give it to them, that you polish it over, give it to them, hand it to them. Strength. 
Say, I don't know what you're going to face next week. But what if I prayed for you internally next week? What would happen? See, I really believe, and I, I, I've done a lot of reading and stuff on the name of Christianity and the name of God's people. And back in the Old Testament, and that's what I want for our church and for, for God's kingdom and for, for the, the, the kingdom of God. Back in the Old Testament, they were a people that was a different people. God had chosen them. Other nations knew not to mess with them because they had saw Jehovah God at work. They had saw his riches being displayed. They had saw just a few men conquer cities uh, that if you went out and militarily sat down and put the numbers to it, it couldn't happen. But it did because of God's riches. Daniel got thrown in the lion's den. It couldn't happen because of Daniel was big enough to whip all the lions. But because of God's riches, the lions didn't even mess with Daniel overnight. The three Hebrew children that the fiery furnace was heated up so hot that the guy that opened the door actually got consumed with the fire. They stood back and looked. So man, didn't we throw three of them in there? Yeah, but God's resources took over. And it looks like there's four in there, and one of them looks like the Son of God walking around in there. And when they came out, the Bible says their hair wasn't even singed on their head. Can I tell you something and not get mad at me this morning? We're serving the same God that those guys were serving. He's got the same resources today that he had then. Why do we not tap into him? Because we bought into this mind concept that I'm just a sinner saved by grace and I have to sin every day and I can't do any better than what I'm doing and I've tried and I just can't do any better. So this is the way life is and one of these days Jesus will come back and we'll get to live with him but we just can't do any better than what we do. We couldn't if we didn't have his resources, but his resources are available to his children. And I really believe that it breaks God's heart to say, I sent my son, I sent my Holy Spirit, I printed out the word for you so that you can know me better. I give you a local church to go fellowship with your believers, to give you strength, to encourage each other, all of the one another's in the Bible. And I have so little visibility in the world today. I think it breaks God's heart. People are looking for me. I really believe people are looking for God. I really do. But they can't find him. How many of you visited with somebody and they say, I'm not going to church. I can't tell any difference in those people that go to church than the ones that don't go to church. They talk like me. They walk like me. They watch the same nasty movies that I watch. It's got the GD this and the F that and everything else. Run to church on Sunday morning. What's the difference in them and me? You know when we'll have power, church? It's when we find God's power. Won't be here no other way. I can't buy it and bring it in. I can't pray it in. But I can ask. Because I want us to go on, he said, the riches of his glory. Now look at this, to be strengthened. To be strengthened. Let's see what my definition on that is, see if I can knock it off again. Okay, to be strengthened by his might. The word strength means to be empowered. And the word might means force. Aren't you tired of God being walked over, stomped on? Look around in the world today, this afternoon at 2 o'clock at Little Rock. They will be having walk for life. You know why we're doing that? Is a, quote, protest against abortion. Those of you that are my age and older, 
25 years ago, what was it, 73, so it had been a little longer than that, 40 years ago, would you have thought the United States of America would be walking because we were aborting babies by the millions every year? I wouldn't have thought that. When I graduated from high school and that Roe versus Wade was in 1973 and that's the year I graduated in, I thought this ain't going nowhere. Forty years later, it's went a long ways, hasn't it? Baby after baby after baby. Where's the gay rights went in the last few years? I want you to think about it. And all of God's resources are sitting up there in heaven to be used. You may not believe that the world can be turned around, but I do. I do. There was, I believe Brother Larry used this at the conference. But go back and read from Genesis all the way through to the book of Revelation. There's always been a remnant of God's people somewhere. Church, I'd like for us to be a remnant. I'd like for us to turn it around. I'd like for us to go tap in to God's resources, to His riches, of His glory, to be strengthened, to be empowered with force or might. Where are we getting the force and the might from? Look at what He said. Through His Spirit, we're at in the inner man. You can go jump to the gyms, join all you want to, pump all the iron you want to, get as strong, get as healthy until the inner man taps into the resources and the riches of God. We will never be stronger than what we want to. Why is that not happening today? And you may say, well, how do we do that? I'm really, really working on my prayer life. I am trying to pray more for you and more for me than I've ever prayed before. But I also realize that God cannot do a work in your life until you become a willing servant. I'm not saying he can't, but he chose not to. He could have kept Adam and Eve from sinning in the garden if that's what he had chose to do, but he didn't. He could make you do what he wanted you to do, but he chose to put a brain between your ears and my ears. And I want to ask you, do you want the resources? Do you want the riches of God in your life? I don't know about you, but I, I've had a lot of thoughts in my mind. Do we even realize what those people that every one of you here, if I ask you this morning, do you know somebody that's lost and does not know Jesus? Everybody here raised their hand. Do you realize what that means if they draw their last breath? Do you really believe hell's what it really is? Do you really believe that that person will burn in hell? Do you believe that 10,000 years from now they will still be screaming to the top of their lungs? I don't think they're going to get hoarse where they can't scream anymore. Their body's not going to burn up like it does in a regular fire down here. It's not going to be consumed. They're going to, I believe, because there was remembrance of, if you look in Luke 16, I believe the memory bank's still going to be there. And I think they're even going to remember that I sat down at family dinners. I went out to the restaurants. That preacher sat there and never said one word to me about that. Look back, I had opportunities at church, but I didn't take that opportunity. Do you really believe that it's that real? Church, I challenge you today to tap in to the riches 